Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's July 2022, and this is episode 298, which is a conversation about the Apple TV Plus limited television series, The Essex Serpent, starring Claire Danes and Tom Hiddleston. Today's guest is Cole Brigette, who is a seminary graduate, a contributing writer to the Christian Research Journal, and a staff writer for the website Christ and Pop Culture. Cole has written an online exclusive television series review for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called The Essex Serpent by Tongue of Brute, and you can read his web-exclusive review at our website, equip.org, if you're one of our subscribers. If you do not already subscribe and would like to read this review and also all of our other online exclusive content, please go to our website at equip.org. Cole, it's good to have you on again. Always good to be here. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about the new Apple Plus television series with big names as stars, Claire Danes and Tom Hiddleston, who is in some Marvel movies and series. And so this particular series, The Essex Serpent, is based on a 2016 best-selling novel by a British author named Sarah Perry. And at the time, it won the British Book Awards Book of the Year in 2016, as well as the iTunes Book of the Year. And it was nominated for quite a few awards. So it did make a very big splash. And it is more of a historical fiction type of a novel. And it takes place in the 19th century. So Cole, can you give us some of the outline of the story and exactly what is some of the main themes and emphasis of The Essex Serpent? Sure. So The Essex Serpent is a a fairly interesting and and nuanced uh, story, but it, it follows this uh, widow named Cora Seaborn, played by uh, Claire Danes, who has got has gotten out of this abusive relationship by virtue of the fact that her husband has died. She sort of takes up this amateur interest in paleontology, which is really kind of kind of interesting. She starts to to hear rumors of these sea serpent that has emerged in the coastal county of Essex in England, and she she's sort of motivated due to her interest in, in paleontology to actually move there and begin kind of investigating this stuff herself. And she's a very forward thinker. She's very progressive for the day. She says the name Charles Darwin <laughs> so several times throughout the series as, as, as like, you know, putting him on a pedestal and, and his ideas and that kind of thing. And she's very invested in this idea of the serpent and believing that you know science and evolution can explain what it is that these people are supposedly seeing in Essex. And when she arrives there, she forms this pretty unlikely bond with a local pastor, Will Ransom, played by Tom Hiddleston. You get almost a kind of Mulder and Scully dynamic where she is this very rational person who is committed to science explaining the serpent, whereas Will is far less scientifically inclined, but he's still fairly skeptical about the serpent. He's much more of a man of faith in a sense. He doesn't really think that there's much to the the stories. He thinks it's a little more about hysteria in the in the church in the local town. But of course, things begin to to happen, and some people go missing, and and there's some subtext of possible witchcraft and stuff like that in there, that sort of draws them into this mystery. But that 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 I think is is the selling point of the show, and I think if you if you go into this sort of thinking that it's going to be a Victorian style X Files, you're going to be pretty disappointed by the end of it, because the story is really about this sort of forbidden romance that begins to blossom between Cora 
and Will. Because Will is married. He has a wife and some kids, uh, and his, uh, his wife is, her, her name is Stella. A wonderful, wonderful performance there. But the series really, really shifts its emphasis um, to focus on what's going on between Will and Cora. And the serpent really sort of interestingly becomes this metaphor. The whole story about the, uh, the, the serpent becomes almost uh, a metaphor for the, the tempter of the garden, uh, which is sort of enticing these two people in this uh, forbidden romance. So it's, it's really sort of, uh, it's heavily, I hesitate to use the word symbolic, but there's a lot of symbolism in there. There are lots of subplots in this uh, series. Cora has a son named Frankie, and he has a, a nanny who's a really good friend of Cora's named Martha. I mean, there are subplots that follow what Martha's doing, and there's a another guy who is single and is interested in Cora, but he's kind of full of himself because he's a you know this kind of a rock star doc, doctor whose name is Luke. So you've got all of these other characters that are sort of floating around and doing their own things, and the story's following all of them. But the core of the story is Cora and Will and, and what's going on uh, between them. So that's a loose overview of, of what's going on in this series. Now, as I mentioned, this series is based on a book, so there are probably going to be some differences there. But the setting of the film itself or the series itself is this kind of like, you know, dreary Victorian Gothic era vibe to it. And in the midst of this, there is basically pretty much a emphasis on the differences between science and faith. And some reviewers have even characterized it as a parable between science and faith and the collision of that modernity coming to England. And yet it's also running up against people in rural areas like the seaside in Essex that hold to faith almost as superstition. And so they're wary of anything having to do with science. And some of that, you mentioned some of the side characters that are, you know, kind of side stories that are part of this is there's some, you know, a political emphasis kind of like on the poor and healthcare for the poor, as well as this doctor who's kind of smitten with Cora. And he has become kind of an innovator of various different for the first time, surgeries, like open heart surgery, at least in, in the book. So can you talk a little bit about some of the show's, you know, thoughts on science and faith in particular, because it's setting up that there's a really sharp dichotomy between the two, with Cora representing science and innovation and modernity and the little village there in Essex and the rector. I think the rector that is um, Will, he is more trying to be reasonable with some of the people while still holding to faith. Yet there's this character caricature maybe of the townspeople that are in great fear of kind of this sea monster that you mentioned. So there's kind of that juxtaposition between science and faith and that they cannot go together at all. Yeah, so th this is sort of the, I think some of the, some of the bigger ideas that it, this is the low hanging fruit of what the show is interested in doing and, and and dealing with, and I do think it gets some mileage out of this this conversation. But but by the the end of the the story, is the show really about this this conversation between, you know, science and and religion? Not so much. Um, I, this is where, again, the, the metaphors in the imagery come out so strongly, right? You're dealing with a sea serpent that's sort of metaphorical for the tempter in the garden. The man, like you mentioned, Luke, the doctor, performs open heart surgery. I mean, it, it's, it's all about matters of the heart and, and desires and things like that. So there, there's a lot of you know strong imagery there that, that you get out of this. But the conversation between uh, science and religion mythology, faith, that, that is, is in there. And it's really there early in the, the series in the first couple of episodes. And what I, I, I think that that serves the purpose of doing, not, not just from the perspective of making it an interesting conversation, because at this point, these, these things really don't say anything new. I mean, how many times have we seen this story? You know, science and religion, the age-old debate type thing. 
I, you know, and, and, and nobody is ever going to do this with as much nuance or, or care as Chris Carter did with the X-Files. Like that's kind of the be all end all of TV shows that, that deal with this particular subject, maybe Battlestar Galactica uh, as well. But in this series, the dichotomy of, of science and faith is really there to serve the differences in the characters. So one of the things you'll learn about Will as the series goes on is that he's actually very educated. He, he has this sort of huge library in this little cottage out there in, in Essex. He really is probably the, the smartest guy in terms of just book smarts in the local community. But he, he's very sort of soft-spoken and, and reserved and closed off. And Cora, you know, comes blowing in to their lives and they, they find in each other these sort of intellectual equals. They can, they can carry conversations and, and go back and forth with each other and, and spar with each other on an intellectual level. And it creates all this like, you know, heady drama between them that factors into the, the relationship uh, between them. What's interesting to me, though, and this is where I think I don't know if this is so much um, a, a conscious decision on the part of the author of the book the showrunners who, who, who made the show and wrote the show and created the show. But Will is, is not so much a, a dedicated man of faith in the sense that we sort of believe him to be. I mean, he's, he's very sort of a, a rational person so that he's not this Mulder type abject, abject believer in the supernatural he doesn't even really believe the serpent's real. And when she actually asks him about Genesis, when they're talking about the, the story in Genesis about the serpent, I mean, he straight up says it's an allegory. So it, it, it's, it's sort of wrong to characterize this whole story as this, you know, what we would think of in terms of the modern debate between, between science and, and faith. But Will is a man of faith, a man of very rational faith, I would say, even though, and this, this always bothers me about how modern TV shows in Hollywood sort of portray people who are supposed to be these, these Christian pastors. They, they never talk about Jesus, right? If you're, if you're trying to ascertain character motivations, they never talk about, you know, why they believe what they believe or, or you know, what it is specifically that they believe. They're just kind of colored in, in very vague outlines and, and, you know, you'll never find Jesus really talked about as opposed to Cora, whose character motivations are, are quite clear, and it sort of makes sense that she is the way she is, and it makes sense that she says the things she says, uh, at least from a narrative perspective. But that, that doesn't necessarily a, what I would say a good character make, and I, I use good in that sense, not saying that she's poorly written, because she's really not. She's got very complex motivations. But to say that it is this someone that at the end of the day you look at and go, that is a, a hero or that is a, a good person? And that, that's one of the things the show does, I think, in, incredibly well, which makes the ending, which you and I have talked about, all the more baffling, is none of these people are very good. The closest character that you're going to find to someone who is probably very selflessly motivated in the series, there are a couple. You have Martha, who says many times in the show, is a, a blatant socialist, a very proud socialist who's pioneering all these efforts for these uh, these people. And you do get the sense that she is very, very much committed to to helping people. And then there's the other doctor, I forget his name, I think it might be Spencer or something like that, who she has her little, uh, who's kind of interested in her. And then the other character is going to be Stella, who is, is Will's wife. And we can we can talk about her a little bit later. She is something else. I mean, it, it really is a... A great performance uh, for that actress. Uh, I think her name is uh, Clements, Clements Posey or something like that. I know she was in the Harry Potter series. Yeah, and I mean, she she really knocked it out of the park. And Stella's a very, very fascinating character because as the, the relationship between Will and Cora uh, develops, the way that she handles this is is, is something else. But that, that's really the core of it. I, th I think that the faith and science debate is, is sort of there to serve the two characters, I think it would kind of be a, a misstep to to say, well, well, what does the show, does it add anything new to the discussion? Not really. I mean, at the end of the series, spoilers for anybody who cares about that, at the end of the series, this whale washes up on shore in Essex and everybody says, okay, well, well that must have been the serpent. Well, 
it, it, everybody knows what that is. That's not a serpent. That's a, that's just a big fish. Like what was everyone, you know, in fear of? And, you know, the, the only thing the show really says in that regard is, you know, people fear what they don't understand. Well, I mean, how many times have you heard that in a movie or a television series? So it doesn't really add anything new to the debate. What it does is is use is leverage those ideas to paint the characters, the two main characters in very strong uh, colors. And I think it works well in that regard. Well, I know not everybody can be a subscriber to the Christian Research Journal. And so I hope that you enjoy this free content that we put out here for you. But I would like to ask you a favor, and that is, could you please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts? Just search for the podcast title, Postmodern Realities. We haven't had a rating or review since April, and that's a written review. Just a sentence would be great because, as I've said before, it helps the computer bots to find our content and suggest it to other people. And so that would be very helpful to us. And at the end of the year, for whoever has given us some reviews or ratings, I'll draw a name out and you can get some swag and a free subscription to our journal. The other way to help us out, of course, is to just tell a friend. I mean, the more people that know about the podcast, the better. You can link to your favorite episodes on social media or, you know, just email somebody or really word of mouth is the greatest way to let people know about the podcast and they can look it up. Plus, if you have a student going off to college, I mean, this is a great resource for them. We're almost to 300 episodes, but we have covered so many topics that students would be very interested in. So you can go ahead and suggest this to your student as part of their regular podcast rotation. Also, we'd appreciate it if you can't subscribe, if you could maybe give us a tip. And you can do that by going to equip.org, seeing the drop-down menu there under magazine, hitting Postmodern Realities Podcast, and the link is at any of the episodes that are up there. Well, thank you for listening, and thank you for your support of the Christian Research Journal. Well, I'd like to actually discuss some of the main characters themselves. And of course, the focal point of this series and the book is the main character, Cora, who you mentioned is a recent, a young widow, and her husband has abused her in the past. And she's married into money. I'm I'm not certain in the series if she did not come from money before, but she's kind of like, It was an arranged marriage, it seems like, by Cora's father to this man who's extremely wealthy, who ends up being an abuser, and then he dies at the beginning of the series. So that's not a major spoiler because it opens up with his death. And in addition, she has a son that's maybe 10 or 11. And it seems like in the series, I don't know about the book that he's portrayed as maybe a high functioning autistic kid or something like that. But she's this very interesting character because she's extremely intelligent. She's trying to be self-taught about paleontology, and she's very interested in, I guess, developing a friendship, what she sees as a friendship with Dr. Luke Garrett, although he is interested in romance with her just because of who he is, you know, with medicine and some of the things that he's doing there. And then so there, it seems to me that there's everyone is around her, kind of in her orbit. Orbit, and in the actual TV series itself, she comes across as an extremely unlikable character. She doesn't seem to have that many redeeming values about her, and in particular, she seems to be very oblivious to anyone who is trying to deepen a relationship with her, whether it's Doctor Luke. Garrett, who is extremely, I mean, he, in the series, he acts as, you know, it seems very obvious he's interested in her and she's just completely oblivious to it at all. And her son is looking for her attention and she just ignores him. And then his nanny also is very invested in a relationship with her employer, just being not just as as a nanny or her employer, but a good friend and offering Cora a lot of advice. So she ends up, you know, wounding a lot of people. And I don't know if she's trying to be um, particularly conniving about it, I'd say. I just think she's a little bit ob- oblivious is how I'd call her, and then very unlikable and very self-centered and um, self-focused. So do you think that's true about her? And is it important to b- portray characters, I guess, with what we would now call, you know, in modernity, emotional intelligence, because it seems like she's very low on that scale. She is completely not caring of anyone else's emotions but her own. 
Oh, absolutely. And I, I think you, you really hit the nail on the head with this character analysis. And, you know, I, I will even go as far as to say that the narrative itself acknowledges this. Look at the number of characters that Korra encounters who by the end of the series have had a, a serious falling out with her over these very issues. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll get into some spoiler territory here, but when Luke kind of makes that drunken proposal, but is, is very serious about it. I mean, her response is, it's understandable in one sense, um, given her, her background with men, but the way she handles it is downright comical. I mean, she gets angry at him and she storms home and she's complaining to Martha about it. And Martha tells her, remember what she tells her? She's, doesn't she say like, you're an idiot? Isn't that what she says? What an idiot? And she's like, oh yeah, I, I know he's an idiot. And she goes, no, you, <laughs> you're the idiot. Her, her, she's caught off guard by that. She sort of looks at Martha like, what are you talking about? And Martha sort of has this, this moment where she has to tell her, you are so oblivious to the people who, like, like you said, are, are in your orbit, who actually do genuinely care about you and want to establish a, a relationship with you. And she's not only talking about herself, she's talking about Will, but she also takes her to task over uh, her relationship, or talking about Luke. She's talking about herself, talking about Luke. Uh, but she also takes uh, Cora to task over her relationship with Will. It it really is like that, you know, wonderful, wonderful song Desperado. It's, the, the lyrics are, it seems to me some fine things have been laid up on your table, but you only want the ones that you can't get. That's Cora to a T. She has all of these opportunities surrounding her, but the one thing she is absolutely fixated on, and I mean, kind of, you know, lays in bed and cries about it when she has to leave Essex is this married man. Uh, like you said, she is a very unlikable character, which again, to, to me, makes the ending of the, the series even more baffling because the, the series has done all of this great work sort of nuancing this conversation and showing how absurd of a, a, a human being she really is. But then at the end, it sort of validates it by having her and Will finally get together, which you know, just, just floored me. I, I know we, we had talked some as, as we were going through it that, you know, I was so shocked by the ending. I immediately had to go, you know, look up the ending of the book because I was like, surely to goodness, this is not how this story ends because it just feels so disjointed and out of place considering Cora's character. There is no sense in which she has to, I don't want to say pay for her sins in a sense, but, but, but that's really what it is. There is no sense in which she has to deal with the fallout or the consequences of her choices beyond just laying in bed and crying about Will not being there and writing letters to him every day. I mean, it, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, comical the, way, the note that the, the series ends on. But I, I do want to point out also along the lines of Cora's character that what you'll see in a lot of reviews for the series is people will talk about Cora as being a very modern person. She's got all of these modern sensibilities because she's this, you know, headstrong sort of bull in a china shop Victorian woman who would sacrifice all of her dignity um, rather than like bend to the whims of a man after what she's been through with the man that, that uh, she was married to. But uh, one thing I find very, very interesting, reading an interview with the, the book's author, the, the original author, uh, Sarah Perry, who uh, in this interview, she says, when she hears people talk about Cora as being very modern, she actually gets kind of upset with them and feels that they've sort of missed the point. She says that she's not a modern character. She's a very Victorian character. She's a solidly Victorian female. And her, her point in that is to say that for whatever reason, likely because of identity politics, people tend to define Victorian women by their oppression versus um, their interests and their vitality. And she makes the point that uh, by the end of the 19th century, they were very active in multiple fields. They were especially active in social justice, which you see with Martha. They were very active in politics, the criminal justice system, engineering, medicine, you know, early forms of feminism, trade unions. They, they were very involved in all of that. And she, she tried to write Cora, to her credit, she tried to write Cora to those lines. And I think that's just a very interesting perspective to have on that character. Because I think it's a perspective that the showrunners, by the end of the series, have, have somehow completely missed. Because, uh, as, as well, I'm sure we'll get into, the ending of the book is very different from the series. 
that that last episode, I think we both talked about just how jarring it seemed and how we, weirdly not meshing with the other five it seemed. And there are some pretty stark differences there. And that, a lot of that has to do with Cora's character. So I do want to talk about some of the other main characters and the other central character, of course, is the minister named Will. And he is an interesting character. And I think also probably one in which this series, the Christian apologist could really talk about like how, and again, I don't know how it's different from the book. I haven't read the book, but at least in the series, I mean, how genuine is his faith? Is he really somebody, of a man of deep faith in terms of a biblical faith? So he does get up there and preach every Sunday, but as was true in the Victorian era in England, you know, being the rector or the minister of a particular parish was part of it. It was a job for some people to do. I don't know how particularly religious some of the ministers were. So how do you think that the show does with this portrayal of this particular minister? Because at least to me, he came off as not someone of deep faith. Or at least his portrayal was in that way. I don't know how the screenplay uh, wrote him up as, but I just didn't get a real sense that he was a man of really deep biblical faith. Let's just put it that way, I guess. Yes. So this is a a really interesting conversation to have, and and this will this will probably come across as a bit of a a rant because I've I've I have some filmmaker friends that I I constantly talk about this with, and that is the portrayal of especially people like priests or pastors um, in, uh, in in media like this, where, you know, there, there are certain series I will watch. And let's, you know, everybody, said, let's pick on the, the Catholics for a second, because everybody you know, in, in your standard, if a person's going to be a Christian in a TV series or a movie, they're going to be Catholic. And there are things that even, you know, I, I'm not Catholic, obviously, but when I listen to some of the things these characters say, or not even a Catholic would say that. You have got to, you know, we, we in police procedurals are sort of renowned for the care with which they give and the attention uh, they give uh, just learning what standard police work looks like. And there are some liberties taken here and there. But the idea is to, to show someone the standard you know, workings of a, of a case and the degree to which it does that accurately, these shows kind of earn their merit. But then why don't we do that with some of these, you know, the, these roles? What, what people tend to do when writing these religious figures is portray the religious figures as they themselves. I like the way you said this, that he is portrayed as, as a man of not very deep biblical faith. However, what I would say is that in the context of the show, he is portrayed as being a man of of deep faith insofar as that's what people think deep faith looks like. And and I'll I'll talk about it in this way. After his moment of infidelity with Cora, I mean, he has several episodes where he's just riddled with guilt. And, you know, the way that, you know, people do deep faith in in these types of TV shows and, and movies because nobody really has an interesting thought on how to do this, is is usually these characters walk into a church and sit there and look very sad. And they look very upset and they look very guilt-ridden. And they don't talk. They never talk to God. They never pray. You just sort of linger with them and see the storms raging in their eyes. And, you know, that's exactly what happens in this series. You know, he, he walks into the church and sits there and he gets a little angry and he hits some things and punches the pew and... For a show that is so careful and nuanced in its portrayal of human relationships, it is it is almost comical how shallow its portrayal is of a man of, of his caliber. And and you know I I think really um, that maybe what the show is is trying to going to go for is that maybe he he really isn't that deep or, or thoughtful in his faith. But but again, I you, you can't you can't tell that because the ending sabotages all of this because by the time you get to the last episode everything's validated you know their infidelity is validated Cora feeling the way she does is validated you know he is almost portrayed as the fool for having waited six months after his wife's death to finally go to Cora which doesn't even happen in the book his wife doesn't die she's still alive 
He doesn't go back to Cora. Cora comes across in the book looking very pathetic by the end of it because all she does is sit there and just write these letters that he never responds to, which is hinted at in the show. But, you know, he goes back at the end and it's, I mean, it's just it's kind of garbage there in the last five minutes. I, I, I really, it really did have me agitated to the point where I was doing that thing where you talk to the screen, right? Which is very embarrassing because I'm by myself and I'm sure the neighbors are like, oh, he's crazy because I'm sitting there going, this is dumb. But that's really how I felt about it. And as far as Will's portrayal as a as a, a clergyman, I, I've harped on this enough. It's it's just it's shallow. It's not accurate. Nobody ever talks about Jesus. Nobody ever talks about what faith actually is. Nobody talks about why they even feel guilty beyond the the momentary indiscretion. Nobody talks about what it is that's compelling them to feel guilty. And it, it's just again, it's it, 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 when when the, the the issue of Genesis is brought up. I mean, he full on says, "Oh, well, it's just an allegory." You know, I'm looking at it going, would someone in that era, <laughs> in in that setting, in that country setting, give that kind of answer to that particular question? It just doesn't seem very likely. But, you know, at this point, we are so inundated uh, by a culture that that portrays men of faith and women of faith even as, as very shallow people. You're either... You, you, there is no such thing as a good person of faith. Really, there isn't. The closest you're going to get in this series is Stella, which I think is brilliant. We can talk about her. But nine times out of ten, you either get what people in the congregation are, which are these doomsday sayers willing to believe anything. If it's a serpent, core is a witch. Oh, my gosh. That kind of mentality. Or you get Will, who is this emotionally compromised man whose faith is not strong enough to save him from a, a moment of infidelity. There's really no in-between with these stories, and I get that it's there to create dramatic tension, but you know there are some good books out there with very good fictional priests and pastors, but they're never adapted, and you kind of long to see a character come in and, and, and do it well. And I, to, her, to her credit, I think Stella's character sort of, sort of does that, but Will is a bit of a train wreck, and it's, it's kind of like you said, by the end of it, he's 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 very unlikable and is sort of as, as oblivious as as Cora. He almost acts surprised at certain points uh, by about his um uh, his feelings with Cora, but yet he turns around and makes all of these compromising decisions. So he, he kind of comes across, you know, like Cora, a bit of a, a, a blundering idiot in some in some regard. There's just this you know moment of infidelity between them, and it's kind of building up in some honestly, unbelievable ways that I wouldn't see it happening. Well, perhaps it would happen in the 19th century. I don't know, but certainly not happen um, in modern times, although maybe it would. I mean, it's the other character I want to talk to you about in a minute is you mentioned her is Will's wife, the minister's wife, Stella, who it seems to me that she in the series recognizes this attraction between her husband and Cora, and at the same time, in a sense, encourages it, maybe because she knows she's dying. I don't know. But so this particular instance of their infidelity um, just has so many different ramifications, I guess. And there's all this major fallout from their tryst together, their moment of passion. And so, you know, you mentioned that you didn't think that the show handled it as well as the book did, but, you know, what is that really implying? I, some of the beats that I saw in it were the scarlet letter in, to some degree, not in the same sense where everyone knew that they had infidelity. I mean, I, in the show, it seems that Cora realizes that, that this has happened or there's something that happened because suddenly he's not so interested after he finds out his wife is dying in Cora and wants to avoid her because his wife even says, you know, I'm going to go see Dr. Garrett. He's going to help me with my illness and let's go see Cora. And he says, no, I know we should never see her again. So there's when the, he, she had been so close, Cora had been so close to the family. It does seem a little bit odd. So I'm assuming that Stella, you know, is knows what's going to happen there or knows that something is amiss or something like that. But he, he's more racked by guilt like the minister was in the Scarlet Letter Dimsdale. But the sense of that, it's not that it's meant to be, but this guilt that 
Will is feeling is really just something that the shallowness of faith or just the tradition of faith makes you feel that it's guilt, you're guilt ridden. But yet here she is just like Hester Prynne in the Scarlet Letter. She's exercising her, you know, female independence and she, you know, can go out and commit adultery and not feel guilty, just sad that she's parted from Will and he's not answering her letters. So I find that really fascinating. I don't know that the author, Sarah Perry, was trying to make that comparison, but that's what came to mind when I was watching the series. I, I haven't read the book in, it, in its entirety. Um, I'm, I'm still working through it. But, you know, after I saw the ending of the show, I, you know, kind of recoiled in, in fear and, <laughs> and uh, uh, ran and, and read the Wikipedia of, of the book to figure out exactly, you know, how does it end? Because it can't, if, if it ends the same way as the series, I'm not going to read it which sort of breaks my own rule about adaptations, but oh well, it, it was well worth it in this case because it is a very different ending. I don't know that Sarah Perry would, would make that comparison. I've yet to read an interview where she, she talks about if Cora is supposed to be some kind of validation, these, you know, independent, again, you know, sort of even modern feminist I- ideas of being very... Um, loose with with uh, sexuality and loving who you want and stuff like that but but the way that the book ends leads me to think that's not the case the, the series that's very much the case but the uh the the book again it, it ends with very unresolved cora is left still pining after will whose wife is very much alive and he's sort of you know, is still living in the, the aftermath of all of this. And I, what, what I, th- I think is extremely interesting in, in the, between the book and, and the, the series, and I don't know how this is going to pan out, but it's just the character of Stella. Because in, in the show, there are a couple of ways of reading this, and you brought up one of them, where it, you look at it and you go, okay, so she knows she's dying, and she knows she's dying very early on in, in the series. And she clearly likes Cora. Cora is a friend of the family. She she's very has a great affinity for her. But when she figures out the 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 indiscretion b- between them, which she does very early on as well, Stella picks up on it quicker than anybody. I think she sort of begins looking for ways to put them together. There is a sense, especially in the series, where she she's dying at the end. And she sort of knows that Will is going to need someone. And I think this is very, goodness, it's so interesting how this is portrayed, where she understands that her husband is a very closed off man who can't talk to very many people. And he's going to need someone to open up to in the wake of her death. He's going to need some time to process. And then he's going to have to turn to somebody. She sort of understands and accepts that that is going to be Cora when Cora finally comes to see her at the end, even after Stella has learned of the, the, the infidelity, the tryst, if you will, the fling, I don't want to say there, there's bitterness there. There's just sort of acceptance and a little bit of frankness between them as characters. What I think is very interesting is, is Stella has a very interesting relationship with Cora's son, Frankie which is is not picked up on in the series, but they're two of the most neglected characters in the show. It's like you said, Frankie's constantly looking for Cora's attention and she's ignoring him. And Stella's right there, but Will ignores her. And there are these really interesting moments whenever Cora comes and brings Frankie that Stella gives attention to him. And she does have that line where they're there towards the end where she's being very kind to him. And she says to him something like, we are very different because of what we can see and what we understand about the world. And I thought that was a very interesting character beat because Stella is the polar opposite of Cora. I mean, Cora goes through life very self selfish in a lot of ways, very oblivious to other people. Stella is the exact opposite. She's there for Frankie. She's very quickly clued in to what's going on between her husband and, and Cora. But, but the, the other reading of that, where she's sort of scheming to put them together, there's a very different way of reading that. And part of me did read some of these scenes between Stella and Will this way, 
the way of, of looking at this is she has this way of not condemning him, but letting him sit in the guilt that she knows is eating him up. And there's a particularly powerful moment. And I was, I was very taken with this, this moment between them where, you know, they're, they're just sort of going through their nightly routine. I think they're, they're sitting in bed and he's reading or she's reading or something like that, or she's reading and he's sitting there and he's just kind of tormented. He's, he's already had his like sit lonely in the church scene. And it, it's the moment where he finally is going to confess. He's going to tell her what happened. And as soon as he starts, she cuts him off, which in, in a moment like that with another human being who is about to tell you the worst thing in the world that you already know, right? At that point, letting that other person get that off their chest, letting them get that out of their guts is, is huge. That's, that's a, it's almost a grace to that other person to let them finally confess this. And she stops him. I was very shocked by that. She doesn't even let him get it out. She tells him to stop talking. And all she does is she reassures him that he's a good man in spite of everything that happened. And you get the sense that she genuinely believes this about her husband, that he is a good, a good man. You get the sense that um, it, even if it's not true now, that the man she married was a good man. There's another way of reading that of where she knows that the guilt that he is piling on himself, um, the guilt that he feels because of his faith is, is enough that she's not going to add to that, that he knows what he did was wrong. All things considered, her dying, knowing she's dying, it's almost like she she takes a, a broader perspective on things and says, well, you know, in the end, I know you're just going to end up with this woman anyway when I'm gone. Um, so here here is what you need to know, and it's it's you know you're a good person. Her last acts, even when she's in her you know state state of dementia, there toward the end of it, her last acts are, are ones of grace and kindness. You know, having come through, you know, in my background, m- multiple situations like this. I mean, nobody's dead yet, but multiple situations of infidelity and breakups. I mean, there is there is not a, a a scenario in my brain that plays out like this that doesn't devolve into like a hair dryer being thrown at somebody's face. Do you know what I mean? Like that that's normally where these things go. And and when you're watching the series, you're kind of expecting that moment. You're expecting that that stereotypical moment between Will and Stella where she just lets him have it and she never once does that, but she makes it very clear to him. And she doesn't just make it clear to him. She makes it clear to everybody else what he and Cora did, because when they're at that party and she says, I would like to dance with my husband. I want to see my husband dance, but I can't because I'm I'm sick. So I'm going to ask my friend to do it. And she puts Cora in that position with him. Well, after that happens, everybody leaves and I mean, that's when Luke and Martha sit down and they were like, did you see that? Like, it's it's very clear there's something between them. Um, so th- there is a way of reading Stella's character in that she is, she is very shrewd and calculating in the way that she handles her husband. Because she is every bit justified at that point of leaving him, but she doesn't. And she lets him eat, she lets the guilt eat him up. In a, in a sense, it's just it's a very interesting character. Stella is a very interesting character, and the portrayal of the, uh, of that character by Clement Posey is is honestly a, a, it's one of those career defining performances. She really is stellar in that role. I want to ask you a little bit more about how guilt is portrayed in this series because I think it's something that can definitely be a springboard for people who have friends that are not religious who have watched this series. Particularly, I think maybe some people didn't know about the series at all, but you know, people follow their favorite actors and they might have realized that Tom Hiddleston was in this, so they decided to give it a try on Apple Plus TV. And so it's interesting because Cora, after that we've already mentioned, after this tryst that they've had, she's moping 
basically, because she wants to see him and she can't see him anymore. And he's kind of, you know, not responding to her. And even her son's nanny is just telling her, just snap out of it, move on. You know, what's what's your problem? You're so self-absorbed. And of course, Will, as you mentioned, is just, you know, racked with guilt. He feels so guilty. He tries to confess to his wife who stops him because, you know, she knows what he's going to say. And it's really interesting to me because this series is portraying, and perhaps the book does too, as guilt as this particularly sinful act, which is not, of course, this was a sinful act, but, you know, there's not, we're talking about portrayal of what Christianity really is in the Bible. And there's no sense of that it's not just particular acts that are sinful, but that people are sinful and have a need to know God and are separated from God because of their sin. There's nothing of that. It's just the typical portrayal of Christianity of you need to break free from your guilt. And that's kind of what happens. We're going to talk a little bit more about just wrapping up our conversation, the actual last episode, which I also, as I watched it, was rolling my eyes because I was just like, is this their solution of this? This is exactly how they're going to let these characters resolve their situation. It was such a shallow and modern reading of what would go on, I think, in that particular Victorian time. But it's interesting as to see how guilt was portrayed in the series because it's saying, you know, Christianity makes you feel guilty because you did this bad thing. But then by the be- last episode, but if you just embrace what you did and realize it's okay, you can be free from that because, you know, it, that's faith is holding you back. It's just like the villagers, they have this almost hysteria level against, you know, Cora. She's almost seen as somebody evil or possessed by the devil because she's telling them that this is not a serpent that's actually, there's an insinuation that it's killed some girls in the village. And so it's not this thing, it's it's science. You don't realize it. Your faith is, you're just believing in a bunch of superstitions. And so the way that Christianity is portrayed is in such a stereotypical and very shallow way. And that basically, once you can free yourself from guilt, you'll be fine because you'll realize, you know, you'll self-actualize about who you should love and what you should do. Yeah, so a couple of angles here. The, the issue of guilt, it's quite a, a shallow portrayal of it. And, and it, it, it may have, have helped the show to have Will talk to someone who maybe wasn't his wife and, and have this, this moment of, of getting all of this out of him and being able to talk about what it is that, that's, that's tearing him up inside and, and why he feels guilty. Because as the show portrays it, is it it's... You know, it, it's the indiscretion against his wife that is is eating him up. When, while though that's a very real component of it, there's also you know the indiscretion against everything he supposedly believes and stands for. You know, in, in his faith, which never comes up in conversation. The most you get is that scene where he just kind of sits alone in the church and gets a little teary eyed. Cora, on the other hand, here is the thing. Okay, I know women who handle guilt just like that, who lock themselves in a room and write long letters, cloying and begging for a response from someone. And I think it is the most shallow and thoughtless thing. I've I've even had to have these conversations with with people in my own family where I say, have some dignity about yourself and how you're going through and processing all of this. I mean, whether or not you're, you're at fault or not, lying in bed with doors shut, crying and just firing off Facebook messages d- does not help you. And anyone with a even remotely objective perspective or just a shred of emotional intelligence would get that because you're not innocent in this. You sort of brought this on yourself. And with Cora, I, I, I sort of found myself feeling the same way in terms of how she, like you said, very sort of stereotypically goes through this guilt process. But, but the irony is that I, as much as I say, it seems so shallow, I know people who do that. And it's just as shallow in in real life (laughs) as it is in the show. But I, I, 
I can't divorce that from the fact that, you know, I know people who actually do that. And that kind of blows my mind. It doesn't seem unbelievable, though, for her character, because her character in the show is set up as this rational woman who reads these intellectual paleontology books that women aren't supposed to be reading, who, you know, even go to professors of paleontology to give her thesis about something. And it seems, and and it's all about reason. And then to have this stereotypical response to being thwarted by someone she's in love with. Uh, it's, a good way to, it's a good way to say that. Um, th- thwarted. Uh, I, I would say yes, were it not for the fact that she is shown throughout the series to be, uh, when it comes to uh, um, what we might call emotional intelligence, to be as, as thin as a sheet of paper. And all of her friends sort of sort of point this out to her, um, and I, I sort of think I, I, and the, the the struggle I have with the, the series is that, like you said, by the ending, it turns around and does this really weird modern validation of all of this, which is like high comedy to me, because you're looking at it going, but but they're all kind of dumb, <laughs> but because in, in the the five previous episodes, you have these characters who point out the absurdity of Cora's character. And I, I do think she is a very absurd character. Um, and I, you know, I, I talk about, you know, the, the people I know who sort of process things in that way and, and do exactly that. I've characterized them to their faces as absurd women. <laughs> it's just honest. And I know a lot of, you know, guys who process things like Will, who just kind of don't talk to anybody and, and sit there and get, you know, teary eyed about it. And it, 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 that's just as bad. In, in some ways worse because they're both two very despicable human beings who by the end of the series, you're sort of told to stand up and clap for when the narrative itself until the last 15 minutes doesn't even reinforce that, which is why uh, when I saw that ending, the first thing I did was go, is this how this book is written? Because this ending seems very not right. And I, you know, go to Wikipedia, I admit it. And uh, I read, you know, the the way the book ends and I'm going, well, this makes a lot more sense. There's a lot of irresolution. There's a lot of consequence for their actions. Cora never really rises above the absurdity of her character. And, you know, Will is, is there with Stella, but he's a lesser man. He's a lesser human being because of it. Um, And like I said, I, I don't know, how Stella is portrayed in the novel in those scenes, because it's very different. I mean, a lot of her motivation in the the series is that she knows she is going to die. Um, And it's sort of implied that she knows what she has before she ever goes to see Luke Garrett. Um, But I I don't know how that's going to be handled uh, in the novel. Um, But yes, it it is, it is shallow, I think um, all around all of them, <laughs> both, both Will and Cora, it, it is not handled um, very well at all. And the ending of the series is, is very off-putting and, and jarring, I think. I guess I'll just chime in that the ending of the series, for me, the part of it that was jarring was not just the actual actions that they were showing, but some of the dialogue that they were saying. Oh, it was, oh, it was hopeless. Completely a modern... T- uh, it, out of character for any of the characters. Right. It did it seemed that way to me too, where the, the dialogue was just so it, it just didn't even fit with with how the characters talked. And I, you know, I, I wonder if so much of the dialogue of the series had been lifted straight from the book, and then you get to the end of it where they try to deviate from the book and they just can't replicate Sarah Perry's prose. I wonder if that's what it is. I don't know. I, I agree with you though. Oh, it was terrible. And basically how I would characterize it, you know, as a spoiler, is kind of like some endorsement for polyamory, you know, like, hey, we can all be together and you can love whoever you want to love and it's all fine because you know what? You can love more than one person. Yeah, they do they do say that right there at the they end. They actually the, say those words. They say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're sitting there going, wait a minute, but wasn't. Did, didn't Martha tell you like 50 minutes ago that you can't actually have this relationship? Like it's, it's a moral, <laughs> it goes against all morality 
for you to want this relationship with this man? <laughs> so I guess the question that I'd like to end it is, should Christians watch this series? Now, I would say if you are thinking this is like your Jane Austen type of series, I think you will be disappointed. That's it's not <laughs> that right. kind of a hair. She's not that kind of a heroine. She might be intellectually smart, but she is not an an admirable woman of any kind of character. I mean, you feel sorry for her because she she did experience this, you know, terrible, horrible, abusive relationship with right. her late husband. But also she comes across as even more unlikable because she's a very terrible mother. I mean, oh yeah. Having her son walk around in the moors late at night alone, undetended. And he seems to have some intellectual challenges, you know, like I said, portrayed maybe as a high functioning autistic type of person. I just and the only person who really gives him any kind of attention, of course, is Will's wife, Stella. So that is kind of interesting. And she really encourages him and makes him feel that he's, you know, worthy to be talked to where his mother completely dismisses him. Uh, but it seems to me that if you're looking for this Jane Austen kind of noble heroine, you won't find it here. But just overall, do you think Christians would enjoy watching this, especially, well, I wouldn't say enjoy. Do you think Christians could watch this, especially if they have a whole bunch of friends that are not religious that are getting into the series? I think it could be a brilliant conversation starter. I really do. I think the from a superficial level, the, the conversations of as we talked about science and, and, and faith and mythology and, and those issues, I, I think uh, it, it's a good entry point into that discussion for someone who is doing cultural apologetics. Um, the portrayal of Will as a clergyman, the, uh, his, his indiscretion, the way he handles all of that guilt, the, the potential for conversation is there. But does the series itself offer anything in the way of what I would say is a thoughtful contribution to the discussion on any level, not at all. I mean, if if you're if you're following the series, like you said, the 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 point at the end is, well, I guess we we just love everybody equally and but but sort of differently, and you know even you know marriage is a construct in a way, and you can just love people outside of that, and it's it's just very very bizarre and, and modern in, in that sense. So um, do I think Christians would actually have a, a good perspective on a lot of this stuff? Yeah, I, I do actually. And it, I think it, it might actually be interesting. I don't, I don't know anyone who has watched it uh, outside of what I've, I've done for this podcast, but I think it would be really interesting to um, for, for husbands and wives uh, to, to watch this series and give their, their takes on it, just to hear how differently people would respond to some of those same scenarios. I think that could be very, very interesting um, as, as Christians, how that would be taken. But uh, as far as, is this a must watch? No, not at all. There are better things out there. I mean, goodness, in, in, in some capacity, you could even argue that the Hallmark movies do a better job uh, than this show. And it really is unfortunate because the show really just sabotages itself in the last episode. I mean, there's some, some, you know, iffy stuff in the other five, but it's really the, the ending where the story is supposed to wrap up and the profound point is supposed to be made that it, it shoots itself in both feet and tries to limp out the door. And it just, it, it doesn't, uh, I will chime in and, and say, kind of like you said, if you're, if you go into this expecting not even a Jane Austen type thing, but but just the way that it's marketed. If you go in expecting this sort of moody, gothic monster drama, it you know it, it's set up to look that way. But by episode three, you've left that behind. And you know I, I didn't even get or, or catch like the whole significance about the, the the girls, and you know the kind of like the superstitious witchcraft making of the the totems, like that that stuff just flew right past me. I, I didn't quite figure out how that fit into it. So I'm sure there are some layers there that I'm missing, but uh, overall, no, I, I don't think this is a, a must watch for, for Christians. Well, I saw that some of that, the time when she's in the schoolhouse with the children and then one of the main characters who's a villager who has a daughter 
And then at the beginning, you find out that they're doing some kind of spells because her other, her sister's missing and that kind of a thing. It's very reminiscent, I thought of, or at least the what the series directors were trying to do to make it a little bit like the Salem witch trials. But instead of it being, you know, this whole village is against this one woman. And I guess her pursuit of science is seen as witchcraft, perhaps, is part of what it's being suggested. And you think to yourself as the modern viewer, well, we all know better because science would explain what they're seeing and they're just letting fear overrun them. And so that's how Will is trying to, you know, with having saying, okay, let's be reasonable. I don't think that there's really demons out there or there's a monster trying to get us. But the assistant minister there, he very much is in this that kind of uh, view where he is very anti Cora and all of these things. So I did get that vibe of kind of like, Arthur Miller's Crucible or the Salem Witch Trials. as, as uh, Especially the scene there in the schoolhouse when all the kids sort of buy into the hysteria and begin the, the nonsense. Yeah, that, that was straight out of the Crucible. And, and what, but I do think, although I don't think it's the best thing that's out there in terms of a period drama, if people are looking for that kind of a, you know, series, I will say there isn't any nudity or that I can recall. I don't think there's any nudity or language, but her language. Yeah. It's a fairly clean show. It is, except for there is the suggestion, obviously going in, you know, there's adultery and things like that. But I think there's a lot of interesting conversations that can be had about this, about the nature of what uh, Christian marriage is supposed to be about what faith is about, you know, are Christians anti-science because that's for sure shown by the the, at least the series people who are d- developing the series that they're, you know, Christians are full of hysteria. And then of course it can spread, this hysteria can spread. One person will say this. And then of course it'll now suddenly the whole village is out at night with lamps looking for boogie monsters and all that kind of a thing. So there is some of that vibe going on there, but there is some interesting conversations to be had. And I think in one sense, even though the ending is so terrible, I think that's another springboard for Christians because absolutely. What is that? That is a very modern thought these days that love is love, that you can do whatever. And by the way, if you're a newer listener, we actually once had a podcast about Christians and polyamory because you, yes, there are some Christians that hold to polyamory. We refuted that. So you can go back into the archives and look for that one. But I would say that's a good way to talk about, well, what is Christian marriage and some of, you know, these modern sensibilities that that don't even make sense in the context of the story, let alone, you know, pushing into what is that exactly like. So I think there's a lot of points for the Christian apologist, especially someone interested in cultural apologetics, to use this as a spring, springboard for many conversations. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, finally, on a much lighter note, I have a fun question for Cole. We ask these questions to our authors so that our readers and our listeners can get to know our authors better. So in keeping with the theme of this, do you have a favorite Victorian Gothic novel or maybe even a Jane Austen Regency novel? You you caught me off guard with this one because I have so, so many. You know what? I really like gothic fiction. I love gothic monster stories. And you've you've really put me in a bind with this one. I really, the sort of the original gothic story, The Castle of Otranto, uh, which uh, Horace Walpole did, that's a classic. But uh, I recently, by the way, I love Nathaniel Hawthorne, which you you mentioned, um, The Scarlet Letter. Rappuccini's daughter. I actually wrote a, a screenplay for. I'm trying to an adaptation of. I'm trying to get off the ground somewhere. So I love that story. I absolutely love it. Um, but I, I just recently went through for the upteenth time. I just listened through an audiobook, Dracula, and man, it's such a well written story. So I, I love gothic, gothic, gothic monster stuff. So. Well, thanks, Cole, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities podcast. And there's a few more weeks of summer left. So if you need some beach reading, maybe you can get a copy of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Thank you. 
You've been listening to episode 298 of the Postmodern Realities podcast from the Christian Research Journal. And today's guest was Cole Burgett, who has written an online exclusive television series review for our journal. His article is called The Essex Serpent by Tongue of Brute. And our subscribers can read his web exclusive review for free on our website, equip.org. To read his review, if you don't already subscribe, head on over to equip.org to subscribe. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And it's in that podcast, he has really in-depth free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube at, in your, with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. 